We are in the first session of, of course, our Hawaiian Culture-Based Education Conference. We are so very blessed to be hearing from Iini Kahakalao, sharing her education with Aloha. Thank you so much for all the people who have joined us today, sharing the space. If you guys have any questions, concerns, or comments, please feel free to go ahead and put them in your chat. If you guys have any questions, we're going to ask you guys to save those to the end so that Iini can sit, have as much time to share her ike manao as possible. And of course, she'll help us guide along for the day. Again, aloha kakayaka to all. And welcome, Ini Kahakala. We'll give her a nice virtual warm welcome of aloha. Mahalo. Ini, it's all yours. Oh, mahalo nui, mahalo. Aloha mai kako. Aloha ini kahakala. I'm going to do my ho'olana a little bit, but I'm just going to start with our um, oli. Um, a lot of my knowledge is coming from my mom, so if you were just in her keynote, um, and I had to go right after her, of course. Uh, um, this is the same teaching that I've been raised with, so we're going to ho'omaka with an oli. Aloha e ie, aloha e na aqua. Aloha e na aumakua, aloha e na ali o Hawaii. Aloha e na kupuna, aloha e na mwakua, aloha e kalehulehu. Aloha e ie. Aloha mai kako. I'm just going to go ahead and try to share my screen over here. Good, 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 good. All righty. Malayla, aloha mai kako. I will be talking about education with aloha for a thriving Hawaii. So, ho'omaka with my ho'olauna, aloha mai kako, o i'ini mai kalani, kia li'i kua aina kahakalau ka'u inoa, o waipio ku'u wavava, o hi'ilawe ku'u wailele, O vai o lena ku ukai, o kohala ku umauna, o kunaka ku ukahawai. Aloha mai kako. These are the places that have raised me, that have made me the person that I am. And in Hawaiian culture-based education in pedagogy with aloha and all these different terms, that's really where the, the foundation, the kakua is, understanding your foundation, your aina. Um, and because of these places, um, it has really shaped me to who I am. Uh, before we begin, I just want to let you guys know um, that I, these are a lot of old photos of me before I knew anything about anything fashion. So I apologize, but this is fair warning already. <laughs> so from middle school, you know, and had the side bangs and everyone's doing the duck lips and whatnot. So I apologize, but I found them. So we're going to hold Omaka with my overall education. Um, to me, my first kumu, my first teacher, my first classroom is white P.O. So on the top left here, I'm on my dad's back, lawn mowing. This is a very natural thing. I still try to go on his back, but I don't get on anymore. But um, this is a, was a very natural thing for me. I honestly fall asleep to the sound of weed eaters and lawnmowers because my dad used to put us on the kuauna as he would do these, um, you know, hana aina and whatnot. And so every time I, when I'd be in college and I'd hear the people lawnmower, I'd be like, oh no, <laughs> because I start falling asleep already. But it's such a natural place for me. It's the place where my ieve is in this actual, this actual farm is where my ieve is at. And so always my PO will be my first classroom. Um, then I followed up to Punanaleo o Waimea, um, where I had the most amazing kumu in the, in the world that have actually stayed with me all the way to um, my high school career. So that was really special. A lot of people don't get to have the same kumus for their whole lives. Um, so Punanaleo o Waimea, um, followed by uh, Kulakaya Puni o Waimea, uh, first and second grade. I mean, kind of my kindergarten and first grade. And then from second grade to um, to 12th grade, I was at Kanoa Ka'aina. Um, very blessed that my mom pretty much made a school for me and my sister. And so we had this um, coming from a Hawaiian language background, Hawaiian immersion, going going to this bilingual uh, school was was a very nice transition. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of students um, that I went to school with were expected to go from Hawaiian language every day to regular public school where you spoke English. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people were labeled special ed because they just couldn't read and write. 
um, and if we, or even speak in English. And that was really unfortunate. So having this this amazing school that most of us ended up from Punana Leo Kulkai Puni going into Kano um, together, it was it was very good for us. That especially with that transition from uh, from Hawaiian to English again, it was a bilingual school which helped a lot. And then after Kano Kaina, I am. Um, I graduated or I went to University of Hawaii at Hilo, a transfer scholar there. And so um, I did my four years there. Oh, God, man. So at Karokaina, besides our everyday eight to three kumu, these were our other kumus. I mean, how lucky is this? I mean, chicken skin. We met with these people, these kupuna, these, these wealth of knowledge regularly. Regular Uncle Clay Burnaman. Oh, I have such good memories of him. You know, I have one of my best memories is being at Mahupuna with him. Him making me breakfast and te and teaching me about the winds in that area. Um, Kumu John Lake, being at Pohola, our school was constantly um outside, and we were a um an intricate part where we were uh luckily invited to be an intricate part of the Pohola ceremonies, and he was always there. We were learning hula from him. I mean. Um, Uncle Jerry Konanui being at Hui Kalos every year with him. Hentikule Kia Kia Lani um, being again a kumu from Punana Leo um, all the way to my high school career being there. I'm um, teaching about, uh, us about the Aina of Waimea. Um, Dipua Case, her beautiful hula. These are all people that have always been a part of our lives and just so blessed. When I think about it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's just, ah, that's just uncle or that's just Eti. You know, when I, like Ati Meleana, she came to our, she stayed at our school for months helping us develop this mural on our very fancy shipping container. And I'm like, oh yeah, just Ati Meleana. Okay, like when I'm older, I'm like, wow, like she's really, I get like, I fangirl now when I see her and she's like, why are you being weird? <laughs> she's a, she's a amazing artist, a, you know, a, a filmmaker and whatnot. So, so we're just so, so blessed that these were our kumo. And so the idea that, yeah, people learn knowledge from a book, but this is where you really want to know your knowledge, right? All of these kumu had kumu before them, and this is traditional knowledge that was passed down to them, and then later passed down to us. And so this is what culture-based education looked like. It's when Papa Aka would just show up to Kauai High, and, and our kumu would be like, okay, close your books, Papa Aka's here, let's listen. It couldn't have even been like technically relevant to what we were learning, but it was. You know what I mean? It really was. And so it's learning those kind of things, taking those moments. This is, to me, after Aina, the second best way to learn is from your kupuna. Then first, like how I mentioned, is your Aina. And so at Kano Kaina, we were so blessed. At the time, we didn't think so. We were like, are we poor? Like, are we, why are we always outside? I was always dirty. Always. You could put that on my forehead. It was so bad. But we spent time in places like Waipio, Pu'ukohola, Pu'upulehu. Um, we were outside all the time, like I said. And at the time, we, we, you know, we didn't know any better and whatnot. And and now I'm just like, oh man, we really didn't have too much, but we had everything. We had everything. We had the Aina, we had the Lani, we had the Honua. Um, we had these beautiful locations that, you know, when I think about when I went later when I went to college and I was stuck in four walls, I'm like, this is terrible. And we pay for this. So learning from our Aina was another huge part of culture-based education, you know, learning from our environment. Some days was beautiful, some days wasn't, and you learned from that. It was, it, my dad calls it's all beautiful. It's gorgeous and super gorgeous. So gorgeous is when it's raining and super gorgeous is when, you know, you have sun and whatnot. But being able to dance hula and uh, about Hilave and literally stare at Hilave, you know, most people dance that hula at the hotels and they have no idea what they're talking about. Um, you know, learning about how Kamehameha built Pu'ukohola with this, you know, miles and miles longs of human chain passing around Pohaku. And we are sitting on that exact platform, you know, that he had his council of chief meetings. You know, it, it's so chicken skin. Um, this um, picture on the bottom, you know, this was a, a classroom, you know, when, when we didn't have anything, when it was too windy and the and the professional 20 by 20 setter uppers, uh, we couldn't put it up because the wind would blow it down. This was a classroom chair and white and, you know, paper 
um, writing paper and whatnot, but it was, it was the best. And this was a, um, like a, it's part of the Hawaiian homestead, but it's, was used as like, um, industrial junk waste, a lot of rusted material. And, and we cleaned it all out. I mean, I was in that original project from second grade and to see it now, you know, become a fully flourished mala and, and Valkele and whatnot. So learning from Aina is so, so important. Um, learning or understanding that cultural knowledge is just as important or to me more than, you know, the, the latest, greatest, you know, voting stats and whatnot and how to do this kind of stuff. And so here we're learning how to make puniu, you know, we are physically lashing the makari'i. You know, this is, this is this is crazy stuff. We're learning from a master emu maker, you know, a master emu maker who has only had daughters. You know, a lot of emu makers that we've met throughout the years are like, it's a man thing, it's a man thing. But this particular uncle only had daughters, so he had to teach the girls. So it felt really nice for us to finally get involved in these kind of things. On the bottom here, we're learning sham battles. Who gets to throw spears in school? Padded. Sometimes that padded, but you know this is um Kyle Nakanelua. You know he's coming here and he's teaching our boys these kind of techniques. You know this 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 battle, but also you know the the restraint ku season versus lono. You know um we are a school located in Waimea and Paniolo culture is is very important over there. Learning from these old timers about the branding, you know about um the 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 pastures and whatnot, and then of course learning from you know hula masters. Um, being actually part of this very traditional style of hula, which, you know, some are part of, some are not. Um, this was normal. This was every day. In fact, what was unnormal was, again, being in a classroom learning specifically from a book. Um, the other thing is, you know, more learning is kilo. Kilo was very important from a very young age. We didn't call it kilo. We didn't know what that was yet. But it was this idea of just... You sit down, you watch your surroundings, and you record that kind of stuff. You make you make relationships to what you're seeing and why you're seeing it because of the season, um, because of the time of day and whatnot. Um, learning how to prepare pu'olo for ceremony. You don't learn that at regular school, I'm pretty sure. Um, konane, makahiki games, you know, thinking Hawaiian first, always. Um, traditional dyeing for our hula material. So it's not just, oh, go to fabric warehouse and buy, you know, 13 yards of yellow. It's like, no, we're, we're dying now, hanging it up, starching and whatnot. So understanding the process from beginning to end, which is again, another very traditional way of doing things. Yeah. Not just, oh, I go start the project and then that's it. Or I'm going to make it as easy as possible. You know, really understanding from the beginning to end. being raised in ceremony. And so um, throughout the year, we are in dozens of ceremony. Just uh, just our makahiki ceremonies alone, we have about five. Um, the kuapola ceremony, which opens up the makahiki. Uh, we have the um, several opening ceremonies in our different locations in Kauai High and Pu'upalehu. Um, we have makahiki ceremonies when we go to Molokai because we go, the winners at our makahiki end up flying there. Um, when the Seasons change and we are in ku season. We always go to Pu'ukohola, which is, if you've never been, I highly recommend it. It's one of the most monofilled events you could ever go to, um, especially for Kane. Um, I definitely know that a lot of Kane have a hard time um, assimilating or even uh, feeling connected to their Hawaiian culture. And so I would rec highly recommend Pu'ukohola, where you see a lot, a lot of men participating and living their culture. Um, besides that, there are other ceremonies that would come up, for example, and, and when I mean come up, I mean, there might be a house blessing or a, um, a building blessing that's coming up. A kumu could just walk in and be like, Iini, Kariala, Ali, Ocean, let's go, you know, and yep, and you go. And we were prepared for that. It wasn't, we didn't need a week of preparation. Okay, this is, we're going to do this chant first. Then we're going to do that chant second. There, it was, it was a part of our everyday lives. We were prepared. Any team was prepared. There wasn't a, like, a special team that always got to go to these things. We were ma kau kau all the time for these kind of things because we, we were raised in ceremony, raised in traditions like this. Also, um, a huge part of culture-based education is the 
being with each other, the intergenerational learning and teaching. Um, you know, besides having your first, well, we, we were a small school, so we didn't have enough to have, like my graduating class was eight. We were a big class. So we never really had our own fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. We were already integrated. Usually you had like um, nine to 12, you know, uh, six to eight, K to, K to five and whatnot. But besides those groupings, they, we had, we were put together a lot. Um, and again, being younger, not really understanding why, probably being like, ah, the teacher need break or something like that. But now that I'm older, I, I totally understand it, you know, and, and, and I had been a part of that intergenerational learning from second grade to 12th grade. So from at second grade, I had older Helmana come and I used to be so excited when those older kids would come like, Ooh, you know, Alpha's going to come today and read to us and whatnot. And um, it would make us excited because this was like an older brother to us, or this was an older sister to us. This was somebody during recess. If somebody was, you know, hurting my feelings or whatever, we, we didn't have to just run to a teacher. We could run to our, our older sibling, an older Haumana. Um, and so, and, and also being younger made me like, oh, one day I'm going to be like that. One day I'm going to be somebody's older sibling. One day I'm going to be able to take care. And it made me excited to get, to get to that level. And as a, as an older Haumana, um, taking care of see your screen, your screen disappeared. Uh oh, sorry, my mom. So now now I know my mom is in my my thing. I told her not to. Uh, let's see what happened. Was that this is um being an older Haumana, um, you know, realizing that I am a these Kiki are watching me. Oh, they watch so closely. You could do the littlest thing is they mimic you, and you're like, no, 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 don't do that. So you know realizing it, a lot of us haven't had a lot of, I have a younger sibling, but like a lot of people haven't had that experience. So realizing that, you know, you're really affecting the way these younger Haumana are going to act, are going to talk um, and uh, relate to their parents, relate to their kumu. Um, and so you have to lead by example. And so that was really important at Kanu. You know, as you can see there, I had so many pictures. I didn't even know what um what to do as far as, you know, older Haumana with younger Haumana. And we got along so, so well. In this top one where I'm holding the carrots, you know, this this Haumana is seven years younger than me, both of them. And they were like little brothers to me. And to this day, when we run into each other, it's like time never passed. We puliki each other. We ask how they're doing. I ask, I know, I know about their parents. How's your parents? Are they in Maui now? You know, there's, there's so much more relationship than just, oh yeah, I went, I went to school with that kid once. Um, and so that type of education is just so, so important. Um, another thing that was the main lead and again, we never used these words because they, they, we didn't need like a label, but it was aloha aina. You know, Aloha Aina, um, I mean, it's always been around, but we never just like, this is what we're doing because it's Aloha Aina. This is, it was more, this is what we're doing because that's what you do. <laughs> and so one thing at Kanu that we were constantly doing is figuring out how to continue Aloha Aina with all of the new stuff coming in. Yeah, with, with, we're, we're not also just stuck in the past and, and, and um, not moving forward as far as technology, as far as um, new EK and whatnot. And so one thing that actually our babies did, and again, this is another form of the intergenerational learning and teaching is our, um, we call them our babies, right? Our elementary. Um, they did a, a waste audit. They looked at our whole school, right? So these babies are like, we're making too much trash. And they saw because they'd be the ones sitting out front while their parents were you know, going to pick them up. And they saw uncles, Uncle Kel guys, carrying the trash and, and this bag after bag after bag. And they're like, that's a lot of rubbish. So already, I mean, again, now that I'm older, this makes so much sense. And as I'm speaking, but for Kiki to realize that, you know, that's amazing. You know, I'll. A lot of people, oh, yeah, more rubbish, more rubbish. But they realized this is a lot of bags for one day. And so they did a waste audit. And um, what they found that we wasted the most was paper and milk because our, our milk was no good. No good. So we would just, you know, dump it in buckets. So we had a slop, you know, white male, you know, we have pua'as that we fed for our pa'inas and whatnot, um, our ohana gatherings. And so they, they came to us, to uh, us high schoolers, and said, hey, you guys, you guys are wasting a lot of milk and a lot of paper. So what are you going to do about it? And they put that, they put that pohaku on us. And, you know, we were kind of like, well, we don't know what to do. But, but um, 
with some research, we found that there were a lot of things we could do with our paper. And so one thing we decided, or we, what we made was papercrete. And what it is, is it's half paper, shredded paper, half concrete. And um, we ended up making our own little blocks, stepping blocks for our gardens. Um, we had some old PVC pipe. And we, so you can see the whole process here, the shredding, the mixing, and then laying it inside there. Um, we could design our own and we had the, actually the babies come, put their hands inside. But that was something super simple that now today, um, I, I think all of us left left knowing like, you know, you, you know, you can do that. Like a lot of people don't know that. Um, another thing that we did, and I don't have too much pictures of it, um, is uh, with our milk. So with our milk, we decided, what are we going to do with that? Well, we did research and we found that we could make milk-based paint. And it's actually very, very um, popular in India. Um, and in actuality, it's so much more safer for the environment, for people, um, because you don't have the same toxins that you do in regular paint. Um, and so we, we um, dabbled with different dyes, right? We already learned, like in other photos that I showed, we learned dyeing from um, from Kupuna. You know, like Kupuna Marie McDonald, she was one of the Kupuna there. She was teaching us about dyeing. In this case, she was teaching us about dyeing kappa, right, or clothing. But then we 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 use that traditional knowledge and we put it into something new, like paint. So we're we're playing with plants. We're trying out different colors. Um, we're also our building is right in the midst of being built, our brand new building, which we're so excited. We almost don't know how to act because, you know, as you see in the back here, we have containers. Um, and that was a luxury for us. Um, and so we're having our new building and we're like, hey, let's put this new paint into our building. Um, so we're looking at colors that are help better for um, learning environments. So we come up with this really sea foam blue. that's actually really good um, for um, kind of opening your eyes a little bit better, not getting so... Um, tunnel vision it's, it's it's really light blue it's really nice um and we were able to paint it and the next day we were able to come in because we have no toxins so so many things had happened just from our babies doing this waste audit and now you know now when i'm like oh when i get my house i would be doing milk-based paint you know especially with all of the milk people are still throwing milk away milk it's no good and even spoiled milk works really really well so that was just some of the stuff um at kanu that I will take with me forever. Um, specifically for me and for a few students that I'm going to bring up, um, a huge part of our well-rounded education was the YPO Water Study. Um, this was a program that started in 2004. I was in sixth grade. So I was in this project from sixth grade to 12th grade. Um, through the years, we have gotten... Um, you know, students had graduated and whatnot, so the project has changed, but generally everyone was the same. Again, at Kanu, a lot of us had already gone to school with each other since preschool. So we were very, very peely to each other. Um, but this group made you especially more peely because it was a residential program. Um, and so what we would do is every other week, we would be in YPO from Monday to Thursday. And um, and then Friday, we had our career and life skill, our Aholoa. Um, where we would be outside most of the time, but in YPO, we were um, we were part of a science uh, project, which I will uh, show you guys in the next slide. Uh, we also had cultural weeks, so we were learning about um, Lo'i, YPO specifically, you know, being a very Lo'i heavy bahi. Um, we got to go on countless huaka'i, um, to O'ahu, to Kauai, to meet with our um, scientists from our um from our water study project, as well as other charter schools. We, know we were very close with our other Nalina Owao uh, charter school um, classmates. Um, we had to cook our own food. So again, sixth graders um, are responsible. We were already responsible for cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If we were in the field, we had to pack our lunches during breakfast. Um, we were in charge of washing our own dishes in the beginning. Um, it was in the rivers. So nighttime, flashlight, washing dishes. Um, we were in charge of our own like household chores. Um, the luas had to be emptied. The slop had to be taken. And so um, a lot of parents were like, when we would come home, they would ask like, um, was my child all right down there? And my dad would be like, yeah, why? What happened? Like, Because <laughs> he's our kumu. My dad is also my kumu. So, and um, he'd be like, well, my kid came home and they started washing dishes. And they started helping around the house. Um, and so besides just, you know, school, we're also developing life skills, you know, understanding that, hey, if this person doesn't help me get this work done, it's going to take forever. 
Um, and so um, learning how to work together as an ohana, uh, we were the only group that had no dating inside because we literally lived with each other. And I was like, but I see a baby is hanging on the line. I don't know, thank you. So, you know, we were very, very clean. We knew, we knew everything about each other. And so these were kind of our cultural weeks. Again, being in YPO, um, going and meeting with Kukuna, helping at different bodies. At one point in the valley, we were actually feeding everyone on $1 a day because we were able to grow and harvest all of our own food. Um, besides being hard work, it was also a lot, a lot of fun. Um, at the time, we didn't think it was a lot of hard work. We were up oh, uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning already starting our breakfasts. And we didn't go down to 10 or 11. And as a sixth grader, that's pretty late. Um, because every time we, once we, once all our chores were done during the day, we had to do the homework for when we were up in Waimea again. So it was a lot of work, but so, so much fun. Um, and so the science part about that project and how the project even began was in um, in 2004, what had happened was before that, the the plantations was diverting water from Hi'ilave, right? Um, Hi'ilave is one of the highest free fall waterfall in Hawaii. Um, beautiful. We have Twin Falls, Hakalaoa. Um, if you've never seen it, look it up. It's uh, In the beginning, it was I had mentioned it as it was my wailele. Um, and so the plantation used to divert water for all the sugar. Um, but since the plantation had been closed, um, water was just getting still diverted and thrown off the pali. Um, somebody had actually sued the plantation, which later got um, turned to Kamehameha as Kamehameha had bought a lot of that land. And um, they inherited the lawsuit. And so Kamehameha and Bishop Museum teamed up and said, besides, we will close the diversion, but let's also take it as an opportunity to see what the effects of a stream returning to its natural river is. Because this would be the first time in history that um, 100% of a hundred percent of a water source is returning to its natural habitat. So we, we've, we've seen in other places like Waihole, Waikane, but because um, there were already houses and, and businesses using it, they did a 60-40 split. So we have had water return to its source, but not all of it. This would be the first time ever in history. So Kanu students were asked to be a part of this groundbreaking history making um, project. And so what we had done was we had gone to IPO. We actually had three locations. One was at Lala Kea, which is above Hi'ilave. Um, and we used to have to repel down uh, to into the river. Um, then we would do it actually in Hi'ilave River in Waipio Valley. And then we'd go all the way out to the Mulivai. On the bottom left, you can see here um, the Kaniela with the uh, regurgitation squeezy. And uh, we'd go all the way to the Kai. So the full effects of when the water begins to when the water exits YPO, what does that look like? Um, what are the effects of it? And so we had taken baseline data in 2004, right before the di diversion closed. And right away, we see low flow. Um, we see high numbers of invasive species, very low numbers of um, native species. You know, we have all of our five species of O'opo here. We have our Opai here. Our hihivai, our hapavai, you know, we have caddis flies, which is actually um, a source of food for the opu. None of that was present at all um, during our baseline data. Um, and then from 2004 on um, to 2011, and even when I was had graduated, we had continued taking data. So we had about, you know, eight years of data on this on these locations of what are the effects, hoping that this project would help and, and kickstart other places to start their own study. And so um, what we had found over the years was major increase in velocity, clean water. I mean, Hilave is one of the most beautiful, untouched clean water. Um, high numbers of um, oopu and fish coming back. The non-natives were getting flushed out um, and became actually a really good food source for the um, ocean fishes. So kind of my cough drop. And so um, these were all kind of things. And we were dealing with thousand dollar tools, right? I'm a sixth grader. And this pipe that I'm holding, this pipe, it's called a velocity rod. It's about $15,000, um, just this metal rod. And it, um, it actually collects the velocity of different depths within the water. The other thing that I'm holding down here is the hydro lab. Um, again, another like 20, 25, depending on the quality in the thousand dollar machine. 
you know, that we are dealing with, that we understand the importance of but what it's doing and whatnot. And we already know the names, you know, and, and I will never forget the names, you know, Hydro Lab Velocity Rod, Velocity Meter. Um, but really understanding that we got to do the practical part of the science, right? If we were in a classroom and we were learning about these steps and um, technically we would be doing this and hypothetically we'd be doing that, I don't think any of this type of knowledge would have stuck in any of our heads, but because we got to do it every day, every single student had, was, knew how to run every single piece of machinery, every single um, kind of um, data collection process. We had three different kinds. We had um, random sampling, which collected um, the flies for the fishes. We had um, uh, velo the velocity, the stream mapping, which looked at the same place for the last six years, exact same location, GPS located, and measured the stream bed to see how that worked. And we had stream mapping, which was kind of like a random, seeing how the, the water flow was, the turbidity, um, which is like how dirty the water is, all these kind of things. But we understood every single part of this. And we were in the water from eight to four every day. So there was a lot of koleana, there was a lot asked from us, um, it's just being, being very young. Our youngest one was a fifth grader, um, that had come to join us. But again, some of the funnest times in my life and a lot of these projects. So a lot of people think, oh, culture-based education, you know, we're going to sprinkle or add some Hawaiian stuff, some Hawaiiana in their classroom. Well, we did the reverse, right? We started Hawaiian and then we scienced it. We made it mathematical, you know, we made all this kind of stuff and that way we could really understand it. But this kind of EK led us to, and this is where the pictures get, oh, led us to doing major science fairs. So this is just me, but there were students where every single year, because of the EK that we gained, because of, again, the water study and the dyeing projects and whatnot, we went to regional science fair, state science fair. Uh, we went to national science fairs. We really understood that. So just having culture-based education doesn't mean that you can't have the rigor, you can't have um, the technical parts as well. You can't, you don't understand science, you don't understand math and those kind of things. That's very, very untrue. And so, if we, by flipping that model, we were really able to understand it. Um, for the last first two years of my science project, I was working heavily on dyes um, and. Kukui dye specifically. Um, but as I joined the water study, I had started to mesh those together. I started looking at the cleanliness of the water actually affecting the dyes and whatnot. And when that project kind of had run its course, I had worked on this stream volume and um, and and a stream bed project, which I had worked on for the last five years being in the water study. And it had led to so many things, led to many awards. You know, like um, now that I think about it, it's like, you know, I got awards from NOAA. Um, I got awards from DLNR, you know, I, I, I could have had a career in that when people hear about these kind of stuff, like, wow, those are some pretty big accolades. And I was like, yeah, I was just, just science fair or whatever. But it's, it's feels good that, you know, that I was playing with the big boys for a little bit, you know? Um, and so definitely having that science with the culture, every, in, for example, we had major projects. We had like two or three major projects throughout the year. Um, where all of our content areas came together. Science fair was a big one, right? So you have um, uh, the actual science classes helping you understand your data and whatnot. Your math also helping with your data. Your English is writing all of this. Um, in every single science project, you had cultural information. So when I talked about VI, I was like, okay, well, there's only little AL about VI. There's only about VI. There's, I could go into YPO. So there, there was just so many ways you could go. So when we would show up at a science fair, all the judges were like, oh, those are the school that also adds that cultural information, stuff that they didn't know about at all. So that was always very appreciated. And like I said, here's a group of students that had won first place prizes at science fair. And we were a big, we were a really, really big group. Um, and so all of the content areas would come together, would work together. And this is what I thought education was like. Um, and so here I am, 2011, graduated. I had gotten a chancellor scholarship to Hilo. Very, very excited. And um, girl from YPO, Hilo, the city, all excited, right? And um, 
I'm kind of pushed and told try Hawaiian studies because that's what you know. But I was kind of like, well, if I already know that, let's let's try something else. So I had looked at all these types of majors, what I could be into. What I realized is that it was really boxy, very boxy. So I had come from this education where I was outside all the time. I was learning from kupuna. Um, I was learning from masters. I was able to actually do the practical work, right? Like, for example, if I had would have gone in stream biology, I would have had to take it labs and this and this and this. I had already skipped all of that and went straight to the practical part. And I understood every single reason, every single material, every single data we had collected. I understood all of that already. Um, so I came from that type of education to now being, you did great. We're so happy. You, you, you got all of this stuff. But here is what you have to do next. You know, this is what you have now. And you have to do everything within here. I have to finish this, 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 this. And I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. I kind of felt like I was going backwards. Um, I had never been in a box before. You know, no, nothing was ever, um, education was never enclosed like that before. Um, I did it, though. I did it. But I had to make it my own little bit. So true to my mama, um, just like how she made her own PhD, I made my own, um, my own degree. And I didn't know, nobody knew it was possible. I didn't even know it was possible. We came across it in this really, really small area on the university website. It wasn't even its own department. It was a department within the department. One person kind of handling it because they didn't, um, they didn't treat it like a real program. When I read it, I was super excited. I was like, oh, I get to design my own bachelor's? Like, you're kidding me, right? I can take stuff that I'm interested about and put it together. I don't have to just feel boxed in, in one and learn things about one that, I, that I'm not necessarily interested. Um, for example, I, had, I was always very into computers. Um, I was doing Cisco in high school already. I was um, doing a lot of yearbook. I was doing a lot of design work already. Um, and so I had thought in college, I'm going to take computer science. But what's the other part of computer science? Like artificial intelligence, uh, robots. Uh, that's not really my, that's not really my place I want to be. So there are parts that I loved about the program. There are stuff that I, there's no way I'd ever be interested in. And so this bachelor's allowed me to do the same thing that I did in Kano, which was design my own program, uh, design something that I would be interested in because I already know what I want to do. Um, and so I had ended up getting my li um, a bachelor's in arts um, with honors in liberal studies. And I focused on computer science, business e-commerce, and Hawaiian language and studies. And so what that meant was I got to take, I took classes in every single of these departments, the classes that were relevant for me. So for example, in the computer science one, I was learning about server maintenance because I figured one day I would have to be collecting data and whatnot. You know, we, we're all doing the... The new peppers, you know, that's a huge database and whatnot. So understanding that type, because computer science is its own language. Um, understanding how to build websites and apps, because that's really where my passion is. Um, business e-commerce, you know, understanding um, that, you know, we're in a new va, a new place where we're selling things online. How do we do that? How do you know? So taking all the PR classes, taking all the marketing classes, taking the classes on how to physically sell your stuff online. And next, the Hawaiian language and culture, you know, learning, still having so much to learn. And I mean, Kanu, you know, was was a great place to start. Um, I always talk of it as like um, the, the, the doorway to what you were interested in. And then you find a master and you run with it. And so Kanu was great, but there was so much more that I learned in college as well. And so taking all of those aspects, you know, when you look at this, you don't think that those three things go together, but they do. They really do. And what it is, is that I'm trying to. I don't like the word Hawaiianized, but just add kanaka to, to things like business e-commerce. You know, it doesn't have to be cutthroat. There can be plenty of aloha where you help other businesses out. Computer science, you know, it's not um, a place where you let your the people you're building websites for feel intimidated, feel like they need you. You know, you want them to be able to run their own website. Um, I also, because I was able to take so many classes all over the place, I was able to get my minors in Hawaiian study without taking extra classes. I was able to get certificates in computer science because I had already taken the classes. So it really allowed me to um, expand and 
I don't take it. I don't say take advantage, but I had the chance of scholar. I could take as much classes as I wanted. So it was, you know, to to take those classes and learn as much as I could in those four years. Because my mom said, after those four years, you're not done. That's it. <laughs> so I hurried up and I finished. And I finished. Um, and so since then, um, my mother and I have been partners in Kua Kanaka. And really, what it is is we're all playing at our strengths. Um, we're all looking at, I'm on the computer side, I had the technology part, she has so much geek in, so throughout the years we've been able to come up with things like Kanata Kitchen. One of my passions, especially from Waikio, um, which I kind of forgot to mention, was cooking. Um, at one point, from 9th to 12th grade, I was in charge of the kitchen. So how I mentioned that everyone had to help in the kitchen, everyone did have to help. Um, there was kitchen crew, dishes crew, but I was full-time in charge of the kitchen. Um, and so that meant cooking for 30 people every meal, um, cooking from the aina. So um, not just rice, rice, we, we didn't have electricity. Um, and cooking for, you know, 30 rice in a pot for 30 people, it's, it's scary. So um, learning how to cook things from the aina, um, bulk, I only know how to cook for 60 plus. Anything, two people stresses me out, but that much, I'm like, oh, I got to get my 10, 10, 10 foil pans and whatnot, and I get them, and so we've kind of, because of that passion, it's really led to another project called Kanaka Kitchen, where um, we teach, uh, we have intimate classes, uh, 10 to 15 people, where we olelo Hawaii, and cook um, with Hawaiian ingredients, um, or using traditional methods, um, but that's a program that we have at Kua Kanaka. Uh, one another thing, a part of my business e-commerce um, thing was starting this card game. So we have a card game called Cards for 808. It's like Cards Against Humanity, um, but a local Hawaiian version, a little bit kolohe. Um, not for keiki, but for, you know, the garage time. And um, this is the kind of stuff that, again, my degree came to it because I knew that I wasn't going to necessarily become a kumu in the classroom sense, but how? But I still teach. My, my mom has always taught us that, you know, you want to share Ike. And so how can I do that? Oh, my thing's up again. Yeah. That's my mom. Um, and so we have our cards for 808. Um, again, a good product that's also teaching as well. So a lot of times we aren't able to teach everything in classrooms. And so we um, go ahead and um, teach it through here. Fun. Um, Ehehene, which is our newest line, again, having Hawaiian language products and services, as well as Kapapalo Io Kili Kwaaina, which is our newest baby. I just I just got five acres in my peel, which we are planning to use for Ea Ecoversity. Um, Ea Ecoversity is a culturally driven higher educational career training. Um, so a lot of students did struggle in college. I definitely struggled in college. That was not, that's no lie. Um, and if I had a program like this, I felt like I would have been aim for success a little bit easier, a little bit better. Um, so at Aikoversity, we're aiming to um, turn Haumana into Kanaka Makua, which is prepared adults um, in these four aspects. Um, so besides um, career readiness, you know, getting ready for your uh, your life and whatnot, there's also, also life skills, um, financial literacy, which nobody's teaching. Um, you have your Hawaiian cultural foundations. And of course, a huge part is Aloha Aina. Um, and so I just wanted to show these three haumana. So this is a haumana um, ocean um, from Kanu, known him since he was uh, in preschool. Um, from a young age already, as you can see, put in culture. This boy is from Waimea, loves the aina, but also knows about technology, understanding the facts of science. We have our next haumana, Auli'i. Again, from a young age, understanding protocol, understanding about aloha aina, um, planting. This student was actually pushed to uh, go to a four-year college in the mainland to study, I'm oh, sorry, the continent, to study environmental science. Um, but we have Kaniela over here. Um, this is my dad's right-hand right -hand man at every ceremony. Um, Kaniela also understands um, the bridge between culture and um, and modern education. Um, he was on the worldwide voyage. So these Haumana have huge accolades. Um, but didn't necessarily do well in a four-year college. Um, Ali wanted to come home. 
Kaniela, it being in that classroom, you know, we had been outside in YPO for years. Didn't work for him. Ocean, boy, my man doesn't like to sit down all day, but wants to work. He's a hard worker. He's a smart man, smart boy. And so just this um, couple months, we have started AI Coversity. There are currently AI Coversity students that we have in YPO. Um, Ocean, actually, our 18 year old, our, our, our Muli, our 18 year old boy, he was the foreman for our fencing this entire five acre project. Um, you know, before that, he had learned from his grandpa, who's a master fencer in Waimea. Everyone wants uncle. And so this was his first project by himself. And he was super nervous. Um, and normally he wouldn't get an opportunity, opportunity like that. But we need to give young people like that opportunities. And he did a fabulous job. Young, right? So he's still cutting some corners. He realized he made mistakes. He, un he undoes it. He learned from it. You have to give them those opportunities, right? Kaniela, he's my main man. This is the way he was my dad's main man. He's my main man. Um, constantly keeping the the crew happy. Um, he has this deep, deep aloha, but he's also so, so smart, especially in the technical part. So he's looking at how we can um, have electricity and Wi-Fi and YPO. Um, Auli'i and him are one of the first people, people to start a solar oven at Kanua Ka'aina, where we could cook our things outside. And so this is the... Um, what we are doing at Kua Kanaka and specifically at Ecoversity is we're taking this hamana that grew up in culture-based education and continuing that in higher education so they can be successful in life. Um, currently at uh, AI Ecoversity, we, the, what we're looking for is an indigenous learning management system. Um, we have there are a lot of learning managing systems um, around, but none of them are indigenous, none of them are cultural. And as a computer science, you know, um, have a background, um, me and others are really trying to find something so that we can teach online, but again, through a cultural lens. Um, so if you have any questions about AI Ecoversity, you can contact Krisha. And if you have any questions about the presentation today, you can contact me. So that's all the time I have today. So awesome, so awesome. Let's give Eni a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, thank you so much, Eni, for all the Ike and Manao. You are truly amazing. I personally love all the photos, so we're so truly blessed to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. You guys are welcome to show all your alohas in the chat. We know that there's a lot of friendly faces. All the mahalos are coming up, Eni. You're free to take a look. 